Welcome to the video, 4th grade fractions concepts, focusing on equivalent fractions and comparing fractions. In 4th grade, there are 7 fraction standards. In this video, we will examine NF.1, which asks students to recognize and generate equivalent fractions using visual models, and NF2, which asks students to compare two fractions with different numerators and different denominators. Many of the fraction standards in elementary school ask that we focus on visual models. Here are several examples of visual models that can be used with your students. Be sure to give students experiences with a variety of these models so each child can find one or two that he and she is comfortable using. In third grade, we only focused on number line models and area models such as circle models, rectangular models, and paper models as you've seen here. In fourth grade, we will focus on all of those models, plus we will focus, focus on set models for the first time. The picture that you're looking at right here is a set model. The reason that we waited until fourth grade to introduce set models is because this model leads to the multiplication of a fraction by a whole number. So for example, if I wanted to find one-third of twelve, I would multiply one-third by twelve and get four. As you begin your fractions unit, be sure to review the terms numerator and denominator. When you talk about these terms, describe them in many different ways. Because the symbolic notation of fractions and fraction concepts in general are complex and abstract ideas for children, be sure to develop a strong understanding of what the top and bottom numbers in a fraction tell us. In a minute, we'll look at strategies for teaching equivalent fractions. However, I'd like to start by showing you an activity to do before introducing equivalent fractions. This activity, although simple, can lead to a great conversation. When I prepare for this activity, I make circle models for groups of students, each circle model a different color. Halves are pink, thirds are orange, etc. All pieces from the circle models are then mixed up and put into a plastic baggie. I give each group a plastic baggie of circle models, and then I ask the groups to build whole circles using same sized parts. For example, the pink uh, circle has all halves, the orange circle has all thirds, and so on. Then we talk about how many parts are in a given model, the size of one part, and the name for one part, as well as the name for the whole. This is a great activity because it can lead to the understanding that many different fractions can be used to represent the same amount. This activity also helps students see many ways to represent one whole, two, for example two halves, three thirds, four fourths, in order to lay the foundation that multiplying by a form of one will create an equivalent fraction without changing the value. This activity can also be modified and repeated later in the unit when learning about equivalent fractions. Here you can see it was modified for students to find many different ways to build one half. When teaching any fractions concept, for example equivalent fractions, be sure to teach the concept before the procedure. Before teaching how to find equivalent fractions, first teach why two fractions are equivalent. For example, start by showing students an image. Ask students what fraction of the image is shaded. Discuss possible names for the shaded portion. Then, tell students that you could call this fraction 2 eighths or you could call it 1 fourth. Ask students why the set could have either name. Then, repeat this with other examples. This activity and other similar activities would be done before actually showing students the procedure for finding equivalent fractions. As an introductory activity for finding equivalent fractions, I would start with a paper folding activity. I would ask all of my students to fold the paper in half, then I would ask them to color one half of their paper. I would remind them that this is an art class, so we're just going to do a quick job, and I would probably highlight my fold just so students can all easily see it. Then I would write the fraction one half on the board. If I have a class number line, I would also post one half on my number line at this point. Then I would ask the students to refold the paper. Then I would ask them to fold it again. When students open the paper, I would ask them to identify now what fraction of the paper is shaded. Again, I would probably highlight my fold a little bit so the students could see it. 
and at this point students would say that two-fourths of the paper is shaded. And I would ask students, did you change something? Did you color something extra? Did you take anything away? And the answer is no. So what changed? The students would come to the conclusion that the only thing that changed was the extra fold. When we did the extra fold, now all of a sudden we have a different number of total pieces. We just doubled the number of total pieces and we doubled the pieces that were colored. So I would say to students, okay, so what you're telling me is that since we didn't do anything or change anything, that two-fourths is really the same amount as one-half. So what you did was you told me that two-fourths is equivalent to one-half. Then we would also post this fraction on the number line. Since this fraction is the exact same amount as one-half, I would just hang it at the same spot as one-half. We would repeat this activity a few more times and I would say to students, okay, fold your paper back and then fold it in half again. Now let's open it and talk about what is shaded here. Again, students would probably at this point tell me that 4 eighths is shaded. Again, I would say to students, did you color anything extra? Did you take anything away? No, the only thing that we changed was the fold. So we ended up, again, doubling the number of total parts. So we doubled the number of parts. Now we have eight parts. And when we doubled those parts, we also ended up doubling the part that was shaded. So since we didn't actually change anything, we could say that 4 eighths is really equal to 2 fourths and it's really equal to 1 half. The last time that we do this, I tell students go ahead and put their paper back the way it was and then fold it in half one last time. This time I tell students not to open the paper, but to predict, using what they've seen here, predict what fraction of this paper will be shaded. And a lot of students will at that point end up coming up with the conclusion that 8 sixteenths of the paper will be shaded and again 8 sixteenths is equal to all these other parts. Then I would finally at the end of this lesson introduce the term equivalent fractions and talk about how all of these are indeed equivalent fractions. This is another great activity for equivalent fractions. The purpose of this activity could just be review of fractions or it could serve as equivalent fraction practice. I would start by giving each student their own fractions work mat and their own set of cards. And the goal of this activity is to get all of their beans or markers from one end of the board to the other end. So students would flip over a card. I have two thirds, so I will move, here are my thirds, one third, two thirds. I flip again, this time I have one half, so I'm going to move this bean one half. Oh, I got another third, so I've already moved one bean all the way from one side of the board to the other. After students practice a few times this way, you can introduce the rule that students can move this amount or they can move an equivalent amount. If I flip over one fourth, I can either, either move one fourth or I can move two eighths. So for right now, I will move one fourth. After students are proficient playing that way, you can add the challenge level, which really is more of a fifth grade level, but students can either move this amount, an equivalent amount, or the sum of this. So I could, for example, move, um, I could move two eighths, and then I could move one fourth if I was moving the sum of two fourths. Once students have adequate experiences using models to recognize and build equivalent fractions, then the procedure for finding equivalent fractions can finally be introduced. As you explained that multiplying one half by two over two creates an equivalent fraction without changing the value, it may be helpful to draw the number one around two over two as a reminder of its value and also as a reminder of the identity property. The second standard that we will look at today relates to comparing fractions. In order for students to effectively compare two fractions, they must understand two big ideas. First, two fractions can only be compared when they refer to the same whole. For example, I cannot compare the size of a fourth of a large pizza to the size of one half of a small pizza. Second, decomposing a shape into more equal shares creates smaller shares. Therefore, fourths would be smaller than halves. Many students mistakenly believe that the bigger the denominator, the bigger the fraction. In order to undo this misconception, students must have ample experiences with fractions using models and real-world contexts. Give students pieces from the circle models, one piece for each fraction size. Then have students order the pieces from largest to smallest. Students should easily be able to do this. 
Then have students label each piece with a fraction. Discuss the observations. Students should notice that one half is biggest and one twelfth is the smallest. This is because it only takes two halves to make a whole, but it takes twelve twelfths to make a whole. Benchmark numbers are important tools for comparing fractions. Benchmark fractions, or benchmark numbers, are quantities that are easy to visualize. For example, zero, one half, and one. Throughout your fractions unit, refer to benchmark numbers. Also, be sure to place fractions on a classroom number line so students can reason about the size of fractions in relation to the benchmark numbers. Then, when students are asked to compare two fractions, for example, one-third and seven-eighths, they can reason that one-third is a little less than one-half, and seven-eighths is almost one whole, so seven-eighths is bigger. The number line will also serve as a great tool as students learn about equivalent fractions. Remind students that any time two numbers land on the same place on the number line, they are equivalent. Then the number line could be left on the wall when students learn about decimals, and decimals can be added below their equivalent fraction. When students begin working with comparing fractions, they should start by using models to make those comparisons. However, students should eventually be able to reason about the size of two fractions even when the models are removed. There are three types of comparison situations that sh students should experience in fourth grade. The first type of comparison is when both denominators are the same. When the denominators are the same, students should easily make the comparison without models. Since they both have the same sized part, the fraction with more parts is obviously larger. When the numerators are the same, students should again be able to make that comparison without models. Both of these fractions have the same number of parts, but fourths are smaller than thirds, so two-fourths is smaller than two-thirds. When neither the numerator nor the denominators are the same, students need to rely on one of three strategies, either building a model of each, using benchmark numbers, or creating equivalent fractions. Here, I know that one of these fractions is larger than one-half, and the other fraction is smaller than one-half, so I can use benchmark numbers to make the comparison. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Have a great day.